Good morning, boys and girls. It's Miss Lisa. Today we are back in our adventure Bibles. We are studying a prophet named, are you ready? Habakkuk. Now I know it's kind of a funny name, but it's actually a real person. His name was Habakkuk. And he was a prophet for God. You will find him on page 1021 in your Adventure Bibles. So this morning, we're going to go through just a little bit of what was Habakkuk about. He was an impatient man. He, he wanted things to happen right away, and he wasn't willing to wait. And he said to the Lord, How long, Lord, must I call for help? but you do not listen. And the Lord answered, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed for I am going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. But Habakkuk had to wait. He had to wait for when it was time. And sometimes that's really hard to do, right? We don't like to wait. We want things right now. And uh, sort of like when you want your dinner, you're really hungry and mom and dad or grandma and grandpa haven't made your dinner yet and you're getting impatient because you're hungry. Uh, it's hard to wait and it's also hard to wait for dessert because we all love dessert and sometimes we still have to wait for that. We have to wait for school to start we're very anxious and we want to know what's going to happen with school and sometimes it's hard to wait but the lord says you have to walk by faith you have to know that the lord is with you at all times he loves you and he wants the best for you so walking by faith means that we be patient and we be loving and quiet and we try to wait on the Lord and his time. And that's what Habakkuk was about. So you can read more about Habakkuk in your Adventure Bible and continue to walk by faith and be patient. We'll see you next week.
Hi, I'm Russ Adams, the pastor of Western Reserve, and before I set up the sermon today, uh, let me give you uh, just a few announcements. First of all, sadly, i got to tell you that uh, we were forced to, because of the pandemic, uh, cancel Vacation Bible School, and so we'll be doing special activities with the kids in, in place of that. Uh, I can tell you that the Gab sale lives on. Uh, October 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, Joanne is still collecting things, and she still would love uh, some more help. Okay, uh, I can tell you that the organ is getting closer, and I can also tell you that uh, we, we have paid for a hunk of it. I think we're down, we need still like 26,000. So uh, if you could keep that in mind, uh, that would be great. Okay, um, a couple prayer concerns I'd like you to remember this week. One is Terry Himes, he's been dealing with lung cancer. Uh, he's been going through chemo. Uh, Jim Watkins, uh, he's been having tests, and they are... Um, trying to narrow down his problems. Uh, Bill Helsel can, is at home and continues to make progress. Uh, Kay Tarr uh, is, is uh, facing heart surgery in the near future, and so we'll keep Kay in our prayers. Uh, Dean Ferris fell this week and ended up getting something like seven or nine staples in the back of his head, and so he is hospitalized. We'll keep Dean in our prayers and the entire family. Uh, everybody that has is terrified of or is fighting the coronavirus and we're praying for uh, church leaders of all churches because this is a difficult time of, of when to actually come in. Uh, right now, I'm looking at October the 18th, and uh, there is nothing concrete about that. We're going to just do the best we can. We're doing the best that we can. So uh, that's, that's what I need you to pray about. Okay, before I uh, look at the sermon today, uh, let me ask you this question. Where is Jimmy Hoffa? Okay, uh, Jimmy Hoffa is one of the great mysteries in our country today. Uh, you know it, he was a, a Teamster Union leader. Uh, he had a, his connections with organized crime. And on July the 30th, 1975, he suddenly disappeared in Oakland County, Michigan. Uh, the authorities looked for him in Michigan, no body was to be found. Uh, they looked for him in various other places, no body was found. Somebody told me once he was underground uh, when they built Giant Stadium in New York, in New Jersey, uh, they have ruled that as, as false. Uh, the truth is that nobody knows where Jimmy Hoffa is today, and there's a good chance we will never know where Jimmy Hoffa is. It is one of the great mysteries of, in our country. Uh, however, that mystery is, is a small one in comparison to the issue for today. I've called this message today, God's Mysterious Ways. Uh, where we are is the, the minor prophet Habakkuk. Uh, this is actually sermon number nine in the 13-part sermon series. And we've already looked at Joel, Hosea, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum. Next week we look at Zephaniah. And as I said, today it's Habakkuk. Okay, um, the issue in this thing is, in this story, it's faith or, or trust. H how far do you trust God in the world in which we live? Uh, so our, our scripture reading for today is from the very first chapter of Habakkuk. Uh, if, you, if you actually get your Bible out and look at it, uh, I think it's verses 2 through 4 or 5. It's Habakkuk speaking, and, and then the rest of that reading is God speaking. Uh, it's an odd book because it's not a proclamation to the Israelites. It's really a dialogue between the prophet and God. So I have called this message today, God's Mysterious Ways. The oracle Habakkuk the prophet received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help? But you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law is paralyzed, and justice never prevails. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. Look at the nations and watch, and be utterly amazed. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. 
I am raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. They are a feared and dreaded people. They are a law to themselves and promote their own honor. Their horses are swifter than leopards, fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their cavalry gallops headlong, their horsemen come from afar. They fly like a vulture swooping to devour. They all come bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind and gather prisoners like sand. They deride kings and scoff at rulers. They laugh at all fortified cities. They build earthen ramps and capture them. Then they sweep past like the wind and go on, guilty men whose own strength is their God. This is the word of the Lord. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, as we come here today, we're thankful for this opportunity of, of, of hearing your word. And we go to the piece of scripture in the Bible that perhaps we have never looked at before, but there's a divine truth there waiting for us that we need to apply to our lives. And so I ask for a blessing upon each person that hears this message, and we all of us make the same confessions as always. Uh, we're not perfect people. We have made mistakes. We need forgiveness. In such negative times, we all are exhausted, and we need a sense of hope and optimism. We would like to believe that our world can be a better place. And finally, Father, we'll admit it that our own death bothers us. Uh, we'd actually like to live for eternity. And for those three core reasons, we all need Jesus in our lives. And so may we find this message of Jesus in this Old Testament story. Once again, I just ask that you just pour the gift of preaching through me that through my simple words, we may experience your word so we can apply those words to our daily lives. Once again, we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Many years ago, before man walked on the moon or before the Civil War threatened to divide America, or even before Columbus discovered a new world, there was a man who spoke for God. His name actually means embrace, but we simply call him Habakkuk. And Habakkuk lived 605 years before the birth of Christ. Uh, nobody knows exactly where he lived, but he is so rooted in the traditions of the Jewish faith that many believe that actually he lived in, in Jerusalem itself. His book, only three chapters long, is not that proclamation to, to God's chosen people, but it is really that dialogue between the prophet, confused, and God. The prophet is trying to figure out God's mysterious ways. Uh, that's what we actually heard in the, in the scripture reading for today. Uh, according to the sixth verse, uh, God is going to use Babylon to, to, to punish Israel. And the Babylonians were a power at their particular time. Uh, several things happened to them in their history. In 626 BC, they actually rose up against the Assyrians and found their independence. And 14 years later, they actually conquered the Assyrians and took over their land. Yet it's God who's going to use these Babylonians to punish his chosen people. To our generation, that seems kind of benign. It was a long time ago. But to their generation, it seemed like insanity. Why would God use this evil power to command his will? It's a good question. Have you ever tried to understand God's mysterious ways? I'll admit it. I have. Our world today, and I've said this several times before, seems to be broken. It wasn't like it was whole before the pandemic began. It seemed like it was broken then as well. Our world is facing some massive problems. If you actually Google it and find out and ask the question, what are the greatest problems facing our world? There's world hunger, there's climate change, there's violence, uh, inequality, poverty, and corruption. Those things grabbed our attention prior to the pandemic. And in the world of United Methodism, our denomination was on the verge of being fractured 
over the issue of LGBTQ. And that battle is, is still waiting. And in those days, we used to go, what a mess. How could it be any worse than this? And then guess what we found out? It could be worse. The pandemic began and, and suddenly everything that we took for granted was taken away from us. And everything in life that used to be just difficult became suddenly impossible. In our time, it, it's really difficult. It's hard to have surgery. Uh, it's hard to, to get married. It, it, it's hard to die. Everybody has different rules. It's hard to travel. It's hard to own a business. It's hard to be a teacher. It's hard to be a preacher. Everything is difficult at this particular time. And everybody that we talk to, the people that we love, have a difference of opinion, and everybody is quoting their own statistics, and somebody that they know that believes this, and, and on and on and on. It's exhausting. And in the middle of the pandemic, we began to wonder, how could it possibly be worse? And it got worse. George Floyd, his tragic death grabbed the headlines, and suddenly we're dealing with racism in the middle of the pandemic. And before long, people are rioting again. Nobody's wearing a mask. Some people are upset about that. And in the midst of a rioting, they decided it was time to take down national statues. And now some people say that they're trying to rewrite history. I was always taught you should never worship history, but, but learn from history. And then just to muddy the water some more in our broken world, if you haven't heard, there's a national election coming. And both sides, whoever you support, wants their candidate to win, and they'll do whatever they got to do to make sure that their candidate wins. And they're passionate about the candidate, but everybody's beginning to wonder if those supporters of those candidates is doing what's best for the country or best for their side. It's obvious, isn't it? Our world is broken. And the truth is that we, we struggle with that we believe, as a Christian people, that God is in charge. So I guess that means that God is in charge of this big mess that we live in. And we're all baffled by God's mysterious ways. Um, there, there's a pastor down in Tampa, Florida. Uh, his name is Freddie Fritz. And Freddie Fritz is at the Tampa Bay Presbyterian Church. He's been there a long time. In 2006, he wrote a sermon called Making Sense of, of Today's News. He thought his world was broken in 2006 for making a lot of progress. In that sermon, he says that there are really three reasons why God's ways are, are so mysterious to us. He says God's ways seem mysterious to us, first of all, because of God's inactivity. And he says if you look at Habakkuk reading for today, in that first verse, it's Habakkuk, and he says, How long, Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Have you ever wondered why God just doesn't do something? Have you ever studied a piece of history and said, It was so horrible then, why didn't God step in and do something then? We are not patient people, and we want our, our problems solved instantly, but God transcends time, and God is never in a hurry. We do not understand God because of God's inactivity. Sometimes we don't understand God's mysterious ways uh, because of God's unexpected providence. In the fifth verse, it says this, God saying, look at the nations and watch, for I am going to do something in your days that you will not believe even if I told you. We don't like surprises. We like agendas, we like to be organized, we look down on people that aren't organized. God does things in unexpected ways all the time. And third, Fritz says that, that God's ways remain mysterious to us because God uses unusual instruments for his will. Verse 6, God once again says, I am raising up the Babylonians, the ruthless people who will sweep away the whole earth to seize dwellings not their own. 
the unwilling and the unknowing are often used by God to accomplish God's plan. The disliked are often part of God's plan, and that makes many people uncomfortable. Now, having said all that, let, let me say this. I hope you don't feel special, okay? Uh, you are not the first person to be confused or baffled by, by God's ways, and you won't be the last. This dialogue between God and Habakkuk really exposes the fact that, that, that Habakkuk was confused. It's important to remember that God is not accountable to us. However, we are accountable to God. And it's equally important that you remember that, 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 it's, that it's equally important to remember that it is necessary to have faith in God and trust God in the midst of all that is going on. Do you trust God still in spite of all the insanity of our world? Someone once said that, that faith is trusting in God even when you do not understand his plan. Do you trust God? That is not just a question for our broken world. It is not just a question of the future. It's always been that way. And we've always been challenged to trust God in life's most challenging time. Um, from 1927 to 1960, uh, the, the Tenth Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia was pastored by a man by the name of Donald Gray Barnhouse. And Barnhouse had one of those tall steeples in those days and everybody came and everybody wanted to hear him. He was invited to a lot of different places around the world. And in 1939, he was asked to preach in two preaching conferences, one in Scotland, he's Presbyterian, and the other one was in Belfast. In 1939, the world was kind of in chaos. It's right before World War II is about to start. He accepts the invitation, and he's going to be gone for months, and so he takes his family. And of all the places in the world that he decides to take his family, he decides that he's going to rent him a cottage at Normandy in France. He preached, 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 preached. Between the two preaching conferences, there was a week off. And so he decided that he would go to France, Normandy, and he would decided to take a week of vacation and be with his family. Uh, he set off for France from, from Edinburgh. Uh, Scotland, the Scottish officials said they really wouldn't recommend that because it looked like the world was on the verge of war. But he was a preacher and, and he wasn't really concerned about politics and so he decided to, to press on. Uh, when Hitler signed his non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, uh, the tensions even got worse. And he says that as he traveled along to Normandy, he, he noticed there was more military people than he'd ever seen before in his life and more military activity. And he finally arrived on a Sunday night late. And he was looking forward to, to spending his vacation in Normandy. Uh, he got up early on Monday morning and spent time at the beach and then Tuesday and then Wednesday. On Thursday, they decided and made the announcement there are no more flights back to England. The tensions had grown so bad. And so Barnhouse took a train from Normandy to Paris, and from Paris he, he took a boat to England. And from England uh, he, he took a train to London, and in London he got another train, and he went to, to, to Edinburgh, and then he traveled by train to the coast and took another ship to Belfast. He says it was an exhausting day of traveling, but he said what it made it made it more complex were the people that he met. The military seemed to be so intense. And he said he traveled with thousands of children who were being sent out of London, out of London so that they would be safe. He said not only were the soldiers upset, the children were upset, and he says he remembers one little boy that was so upset, so pitiful, that the little boy wet his pants. And he said the terror of that little boy stuck in his brain. Uh, Barnhouse finally arrived by train in Belfast. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. And when he got there, he had to preach early in the morning. It was 11 o'clock, and it was September the 3rd, 1939. 
He had been traveling and didn't really know what was going on, and he didn't realize that on that particular day at 11 o'clock when he was supposed to preach, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain was about to announce that Britain had declared war against Germany. And when he heard that, he's like all preachers, he goes, nobody's going to come to church today because they want to hear the Prime Minister. And so when he got there and he showed up, he didn't really know what to say because he figured the church was going to be empty, but instead the church was full. And one of the people on the committee that invited him as he ready to walk into the sanctuary said, I hope you have a good sermon today. It may be the last sermon that some of these men ever heard. And when he walked in, the place was packed. It was the largest church in, in, in Ireland, uh, St. Enoch's. And then he stood there and he realized it was now an historic date, September the 3rd, 1939. He had to have just the perfect words. And he took the manuscript that he had prepared weeks earlier and he just discarded it. And he said, these really are not the right words for today. And instead what he did was he, he sort of just spoke off the cuff. And he decided that the best message to preach on would be on Matthew 24, 6. And that particular verse simply says, fear not of war or rumors of war, do not be troubled. He looked out and he saw those soldiers that would be going to the war, and he, he thought about his trip and how hard it was, and he thought about that little boy who had wet his pants, and he thought about the tension that was going on in the world, and so he recited that trip of his, and after every trip, the church bells rang, he said, do not be troubled. He thought about homes being destroyed in this war that was impending, and he simply said, do not be troubled. He thought about soldiers that would die and never see their loved ones again, and he said, do not be troubled. And he thought about children that were being ripped out of their mother's arms for safe reasons. And he said, do not be troubled. They say that the sanctuary was full of tension on that particular day. How could anybody say do not be troubled when they were in the face of war? And in the midst of that litany of all those things they were not to worry about, he finally stopped, looked at the congregation, and he said, do not be troubled. These are either the words of an insane man or the words of God? And then he answered the question. These are the words of God. Men are dying. Do not be troubled. Children are crying. Do not be troubled. And yet of all that, in spite of all that, Jesus was still God. And Jesus was still in control. Jesus Christ is God, and Jesus Christ is the Lord of history. Jesus Christ is the God of our broken world, and Jesus Christ is the God that has, de that has laid every detail. It is impossible to surprise God, astonish God, bewilder God, confuse God, because God is God, and God is still in control. It is the message of the ages. It is what God was trying to tell Habakkuk all those years ago. And it's what God is trying to teach us today. The question is, how far do you trust God? Remember the quote, faith is trusting in God when you don't understand his plan. And all of God's people said, Amen. Let us all pray. Dear Father, as we come here today, we recognize that, that, that with your small finger, you made the channel of history, and all of history runs through that channel, and it was your creation from the beginning, and you are still in control today. May we never, ever forget it. Once again, it is your will, nothing more, nothing less nothing else. Amen.
In the 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it says this. It says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is the body of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is his blood. Will you please pray with me? Dear Father, once again, we're thankful that we have an invitation to this table. Jesus could have spent that last meal, that last supper, uh, with blood relatives. But he decided to include other people, people that were closer to him, people that shared this common mission of the ministry. And he took an old stale ritual and he made it something new. Father, we're, you are always doing something new. And so may we be palatable enough, soft enough, flexible enough to be always be doing your will in a new way. Once again, we pray all these things in the strong name of Jesus. Amen. Sorrow. 